we'll get started. So my name is Rick Conrad. I'm a pre-sales engineer for Cloudera. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not Cloudera specific. It's open source. Uh, as this uh, incubates, it will be turned over to Apache for management. So just like everything else that gets created. Um, currently, Kudu is in beta. It uh, got released September 28th with another thing you might be interested in called record service. So if you have security requirements that Sentry doesn't currently meet, you should go look at record service. I actually thought about doing record service today, but Kudu is a little more exciting, so I picked that. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. If it's too much, then we'll push it to the end of the, um, the, end of the slide deck, and then we can have however deep a conversation that you want. So this is the essentially the agenda that I'm going to run through today. What's Kudu? Use cases for Kudu. Uh, design and internals. I'm not going to go way deep into the internals. Um, only one code example in my presentation. <laughs> so don't don't fall asleep when I do that one. It's actually just the justification for benchmarking. A couple simple benchmarks on how Kudu compares to existing storage mechanisms in Hadoop. And then I'll tell you how you can get started with Hadoop and how to join the beta program if you want to do that. Or if you guys want to submit code and contribute to the Apache project, um, Kudu, Kudu yeah, I'll, I'll show you how to do that as well. So what is Kudu? It's a large African antelope with stripes. All right, that's it. Any questions? <laughs> no, no questions? All right. <coughs> So if you look at the current landscape for data storage in Hadoop, you've got the classic HDFS, right? So everybody understands HDFS, very large block styles, block sizes, scan only. You can't, the data is not mutable. You cannot update it in place. You can append to the files, but you have to do some monkey business. If you need to update data, you gotta recreate it, store it in HBase temporarily, and then put it back into whatever file structure you're using in HDFS. And then on the other side of the house is HBase, right? HBase is mutable, very fast, simple, quick lookups, single rows if you want to do that, basically indexed by the key. So schema design in HBase is absolutely critical for HBase to be able to do anything, right? HBase suffers in performance when you do large scans. So this whole idea of large scans is kind of the basis for Hadoop if you think about it. Whether it's Drill or Phoenix or Impala, or now, as I got reminded by my pivotal friends out front, Hawk, which has been open source. Those are all massively parallel SQL engines, right? And the whole idea behind those is to scan your data, which should be very large data set sizes, in parallel across as many machines as necessary. So it was never important in Hadoop to have a combination of both, right? You picked one or the other for your use case and you went about your business. So where Kudu is gonna fit is in between those two technologies. So it's gonna bring the benefits of each one to generalize data storage. So you'll be able to scan tables in Kudu. You'll also be able to do individual row lookups in Kudu. You'll have primary keys, you'll have indexes, you can have compound keys. All those things will be available. So Kudu's gonna fit essentially right there in the center. You'll still have high throughput for scanning. It'll work exactly like it does currently when you use one of the SQL engines. Um, the difference is really going to be around latency, low latency, because you'll be able to do single column, single row lookups. Um, the CPU performance, we put this in here because um, one of the customers that's helping drive the direction of Kudu is constantly updating their hardware profile. And as, as Hadoop has matured, hardware has matured right along with it, so now there are more Hadoop specific solutions around more memory, much faster disk, and in some case they're using um, NAND and some other flash technologies to store the data. So that basically to Hadoop it looks like it's a spindle, it looks like hard disks, but it's actually near RAM speed to access the data. So basically what that did is that moved the bottleneck from being I.O. bound, in a lot of cases, to being CPU bound. So a lot of the things that the large memory footprints, the speed of access, makes these columnar row or columnar, columnar data stores very efficient. And that's what Kudu is essentially. Um, expressive and evolvable data model. So really the difference, if you do SQL in Hadoop, 
you use the Hive Meta Store, you have files out there, whatever format is your favorite format, and you essentially map that file structure, which can be structured or unstructured data, but you have to tell the SQL engine what the data is. So you do that by essentially mapping, if you think about it if you're from a relational background, it's kind of like creating a view over the data. And that doesn't exist, the data is not copied, it's not replicated, it's just essentially a design metric on how to access that table, that data, through a table metaphor. Right, so I can write a SQL query. Select all star from web server logs, right, which could just be a bunch of crap. But you've defined it, this, this row is name, this row is IP address, whatever it might be. So you can use SQL semantics to then access data directly out of HDFS. So, so the problem with that is, is since the data really isn't mapped, you can't do some of the things that you would want to do to that table um, via schema, right? So it's the classic schema on read versus schema on write. So Kudu changes that a little bit, and now you're going to have essentially a defined schema for the tables when you create them in, in Kudu, which is going to give you some of the benefits that you get with a relational database. You'll be able to update data in place, you'll have primary keys, you'll have the ability to do indexing, so a variety of features built in around that. I'm going to just skip over this slide because I talked about this briefly already, but this is essentially the changing hardware landscape which is going to make Kudu far more effective. Um, this is something we didn't have years ago, but now tremendous performance increases uh, both from disk access and memory sizes. <coughs> So for those of you who are familiar with the Hadoop stack, so basically Kudu is going to fit down here at the bottom in the data integration and storage layer. So it's going to be, you didn't like my light blue slides? Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so it fits down in the bottom of the stack, right? It's another storage layer. So it's complementary to both HDFS and any of the NoSQL databases you use, HBase, whatever that might be. Um, so it fits in down there. The security, once again, layers on top, Sentry, Record Service, all the things that you're currently doing for security, whether it's Kerberos or encryption, all of those things work. And then the actual execution engines, whether it be MapReduce, Spark, Hive, Impala, Drill, whatever it is, it's going to be able to access the data directly from that. So the, one of the primary features of Kudu, and I mentioned this a couple times already, is the fact that you can update data in Kudu directly. So it opens up a, a, a variety of different use cases that were very complicated to implement and, and design in the past, you'll simply be able to do now. And one of those is streaming data scenarios. Where data comes in, you may have to update a row that already existed instead of appending to the file, making it difficult to find. So I have a couple slides later on that kind of map out that pipeline and how it's simplified by what Kudu provides. Um, so basically, um, Kudu is going to be, um, it's released under the Apache license currently. The project isn't managed by Apache yet because it's not far enough along in the process. The beta, as I mentioned, was released about three weeks ago. You can download the code. Um, there's a variety of ways to play with the beta itself. You can put it in your Hadoop cluster and mess with it. You can, there, there's actually a VM you can download that is sort of a mini cluster that has Kudu in it, and you can experiment with it that way as well. So using Kudu, how is it different? Well, it's gonna, the tables in Kudu now are going to have SQL-like schemas to them. So you have to predefine the data types that you're gonna store in that table, and you're gonna have to define a primary key. Now the primary key can be a composite key, multiple fields put together, right? So, so an index, you wanna think about it that way. But you have to predefine the, the actual field data types ahead of time which is a little bit different in the Hadoop world because that was one of the advantages, perceived advantages of Hadoop in the past, is that you never had to predefine a schema. You just plopped the data down and you came and read it with whatever tool you wanted and you defined the way the file was gonna to look to that tool at execution point. So it's gonna be a little different in Kudu, you're gonna predefine them and that gives you a variety of features that you couldn't have done before. There'll also be a finite number of columns. I actually don't know what that number is. It's it's very large, so I don't think you're going to actually run into any issues around that. But historically, there was no limitation because there was no schema applied to the file, so it could be a file with a million columns and nobody cared. Um, 
but around this structure there will be a finite um, number of columns. Various data types, these are the ones being supported in the beta itself. Um, you can do altered tables. So if you guys from a relational uh, database background, if you want to add columns, remove columns, create other keys, you can do all of that with simple SQL semantics now on the same data. So you can you essentially can have multiple representations of that. Um, out of the box, in terms of API access, so if you're going to do uh, table access through MapReduce or Spark or some of those things, the APIs are built in now for Java, C++. Um, it appears that we're going to support Python um, when this goes, when this finally goes GA sometime in the future. <laughs> and I, I didn't do the legal disclaimer, but um, it looks like the beta's been released now. I think we have the next uh, release of the beta scheduled for like three weeks from now. But it appears that this will be GA in the, in the early summer. So. <clears throat> It supports both SQL access and no SQL access. So, and what I mean by that is the current execution. So if you're doing Spark code and you want to access it from your APIs, all the APIs are available to access the Kudu data as well. How are we doing? Am I going too fast? This is making sense? All right, all right. You missed my jokes at the beginning, Kim. I'm heartbroken, so anyway, all right. <laughs> No, no, you had to be there. So, all right, so what, so I told you what Kudu was, what is Kudu not? So Kudu is not a SQL interface itself. So it's not a replacement for Impala or Drill, Drill or Phoenix or any of those kinds of things. It's a storage layer. It's a kind of a bring your own SQL idea, and I'll talk about why it's a better fit for SQL initially than it, it is for the other technology, technologies, but all of that will roll out when it goes to GA. So it's not an application that runs on HDFS. It's a complementary storage layer. It's different than HDFS. So if you have files in Kudu, they won't be in HDFS. Well, the same file won't be. You could have the, the original file still archived in HDFS. But So it's an alternative. It's not a replacement. Yeah, I yes, go ahead. So that could be a different database? Or? It's not really a different database. It's a different file system the way to think about so that. The yes. So, and we expect to have that, right? In my demo environment, I have, you know, HDFS running on this mount point, and on a different mount point, I have Kudu. So Kudu's a file system. As you'll see here as we go forward, it has a lot of the features of HDFS, like automatic replication. Um, so it, it does a lot of the things that HDFS does with its data files automatically, Kudu will do as well. So don't be frowning, but it does. <laughs> it has a master-slave um, structure very similar to the name node structures in HDFS. So it keeps track of where the files are at, there's a lookup table, it knows if it's under replicated, if it knows a machine went down where some of the replicates were, it'll redo them. They're called something different here in Kudu, obviously. So it's not a replacement for HDFS or HBase, it's complementary technology. The, the use case that you're deploying and designing on needs these kinds of things, then you'll simply direct them to Kudu. So let's look at a couple use cases. <clears throat> so thinking about what Kudu, the so design point, go ahead. Sorry, going back to the previous point, can we add install Kudu on top of another platform itself? Yes. When you install Kudu on your um, platform, it doesn't use HDFS. It's a, it's a separate storage layer. So when you install it, whatever your distribution of choice is, it will simply be a service and it will let you create a file system that's Kudu. I can see you're struggling with that. So when you create when you create a Hadoop installation, you install HDFS. You install the service and you also install the file system. You tell it where the file system should go on the disk. It's exactly the same with Kudu. It will install the service, the master service just like a, the master node in a name node configuration, and it will install a file system. You'll tell it where to go. So slash DFS is where HDFS lives, slash Kudu is where Kudu lives. So it's a different file system. Or it works in connection with HDFS. It works in the connection with HDFS. So you can copy data from HDFS into Kudu and vice versa, but it's, it's separate. The access is separate. The management of the data stored in Kudu is separate from HDFS. 
So it mimics the, the management of the files like HDFS, but it's all contained in. So you could have it just this tremendous flexibility. You can co-locate it with HDFS file systems, or it could be separate. You could have separate nodes that run Kudu. So these are just kind of an example, a couple of examples of what I talked about in terms of the simultaneous combination of access methods. Um, things like time series data, where data is coming in very fast, you have to append it, um, but you might have, you might want to be reading out of that same data at the same time, which is problematical in the HDFS. So typically, what you do is you have big HDFS files. You'd be reading historical data. You'd be capturing the time series data with Kafka or Flume or whatever it was, and typically you'd be putting that in HBase because you can do very fast inserts keep up with the streams of data, and then in a batch mode, off to the side at night, you'd recreate the HDF files, HDFS files by merging in the HBase data. You won't have to do that now. Same kind of scenario applies to machine data analytics and online reporting. So if I'm doing, let's just use it for an example, if I'm doing analytics on data that I'm capturing at a very high volume, I'm limited into how I can query that data. I can put it in HBase and I can do queries. But what if, I, what if my analytics platform is all based SQL based? I have tools, MicroStrategy, Cognos, Tableau, on and on, pick your tool. That's what my analysts use. Somewhat difficult, there is a solution, Phoenix, which kind of provides that. It has nothing to do with you guys are in Phoenix. That's the name of the project. But it's not really richly supported, not a whole lot of development going on. So, so then you came up with these ETL pipelines. Right? So I can't do real-time analytics on that stream of data. I have to process it first. If you capture that data, plunk it down in Kudu, it's available instantly. The second it gets written, I can access it. And it's in the SQL format that I expect. Try to make sure I'm not going too fast here. I had too much coffee this morning. <coughs> So, Kudu's basic design, as I've mentioned a couple times, it's typed storage, which is vastly different than the way you typically deal with data in Dupe, unless you're using HBase. Um, the basic construct in Kudu is a table. So, the tables are broken into something called tablets. Is that right? Tablets, yeah. And uh, that's essentially a way to distribute the data through partitioning. So if you think about partitioning, right, you have large data sets. You typically want to partition the data that could be by date. It could be like location, geographic partitioning, so that when you run queries, you only have to pick the partitions that contain the data that you want. It's classic data warehouse query structure. So a couple different um, partitioning schemas in Kudu out of the box, range partitioning and hash partitioning. So if you guys have done those kinds of partitioning strategies, that's both of them are supported. So tablets can be on the same machine. So I've got a table structure. I've broken it into, let's say we're doing monthly buckets. I've got 12 partitions or tablets. They could be on the, all on the same machine if your data set is small enough. Or the tablets can actually be on other machines to distribute the tablets according to the distribution that you want in your hardware program. Kudu itself manages this, I'm gonna have a test on this later. Um, this actually idea of Paxos-like quorum. Anybody here, relational background? Anybody wrote transactional code? How do you make sure that a transaction occurs across multiple tables in the same or in multiple databases? What's that called? Oh, come on. She's got a t-shirt for you. Two-phase commit. So Paxos is essentially the same idea, but in a distributed environment. So you, you still have, now you have transactionality <coughs> to the updates, deletes, or inserts in, in Kudu. It's a little different because it works in a distributed environment, so the coordinator can be elected, you can have multiple coordinators. So it's more robust than the classic two-phase commit idea where, hi, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna write this data, are you ready to write this data? So you had that two-way communication and you both wrote it at the same time. If something happened before you got it written, you rolled it all back. Same idea here, just in a distributed format, a little different technology, but, but same basic concept. <coughs> so that's to maintain consistency. So what's the other issue with consistency when you have relational queries? 
you guys are from an Oracle background, Oracle calls this multi-version read consistency. That's the idea where people, data is mutable in Kudu, Kudu, sorry. So it can be updated. Well, data could be updated after I kick off my query. So some of the databases allow that, they call it a dirty read. Oracle, one of their marketing things is they don't ever read dirty data, uncommitted transactions. So the way that Kudu handles this is it timestamps all of the data. So if you're familiar with HBase, you have this idea of multiple versions of the same record based on timestamp. They don't get thrown out unless you tell it to. So you're able to kick off queries that look at the timestamp. So I'm gonna start a query that does something for 15 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever, and I kicked it off at 10.35. So the only data available to me at 10.35 is data that was written before I kicked the query off. So I have consistent data. So you can come back two months from now, run the same query with the same date and timestamp, get the same results. So I don't have, I'm not trying to analyze moving data, which is a nightmare, right? Um, that's enough about that. Is it? You guys done with that? All right. Architecturally supports geographic distribution. It's active-active, so you can have multiple masters. So if you fail over scenarios, you don't die. Um, the tablets, uh, those are actually replicated, very much similar to the way HDFS replicates blocks across your, your Hadoop cluster. Same thing happens on tablets. The master keeps track of how many replicants there are. It will rebalance the data, re-replicate if necessary, either disk failure, machine failure, whatever it might be. So I mentioned already it's that the tables are horizontally partitioned, range or hash. For you guys that just can't go through a presentation without seeing a little bit of code, there's some SQL on how to do it. Um, N replicas, N being a configurable parameter, just like in HDFS. What's your replication factor on blocks? Three, five, 50, 100, whatever it might be. Same thing here. Raft consensus is just that thing I just talked about. It's the Quorum API, it's actually called Raft. Um, if you can't sleep at night, go read that paper. Um, anyway, so that's how we keep everything in sync. Um, nothing different there. Oh, it's my favorite slide. So how do you architect Kudu? So, as you can see, it's very similar to the way that data access is achieved through HDFS as well. So I've got a client out here, it could be a SQL client, it could be an API client, and it wants to query a table. So the first thing it has to do, obviously, is it has to find out where the data is. Because what do we do in Hadoop? We send the query to the local copy of the data, wherever that is in the cluster. Don't want to move it across the network, especially large data sets, we want to go right to where the data is. So the first thing I'm going to ask I gotta ask the master server, the Kudu master, where's the data? So clearly the Kudu master, very similar to the master node in HDFS, is essentially an index of metadata where all the data is. So, <coughs> so whether that's API based or SQL based, the answer is, oh great, that data happens to live here. And by the way, it lives here, 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 here as well gonna let you make the decision to where to go get the data. Now, if you're using a SQL engine like Impala, all of this is done invisibly. But if you're writing API-based code in either Java, C++, Scala, or Python, you'll make these decisions in your code. Where do I wanna go get the data? <coughs> so you can see here that in my little schematic here, I've highlighted in yellow where the data is. So I'm gonna do whatever processing now that I know where the data is, and the data is cached. So it's cached both at the client level, so that if, you have, if you're doing a large data set processing, you don't have to keep going to the master node to find out where your data is, you've cached it. Impala and some of the other SQL engines are gonna do this automatically. So not only is the location of the data gonna be cached, but the data is gonna be cached as well. So then I simply go through my processing algorithm, whatever that might be, and I've decided that I'm gonna update Rick, change my title maybe to vice president or something, and boom, I'm gonna go update that. So you can see here that I've got a master node, and then I have essentially two active-active backups. So those serve two purposes. One, obviously a failure. So obviously you're not gonna run these all in the same box in production. So if master A goes away, 
B and C, one of B, one of them, B or C, whichever is the leastly light loaded, is going to take, become the master, and it's going to identify that to all of the tablets. So once again, very similar to the way HDFS manages high availability. The, the master nodes, some of the other things that they do as well, is they keep track of replication. So maybe we lost this machine, so now we're under replicated on those blocks those files in this scenario. So it will actually re-replicate them automatically, rebalance. <laughs> so the tablet design itself, so these are the individual components that make up a table. You can have a table with no tablets. Go ahead. Does that imply tablets are so uh, dictated on a single node? Or so a tablet, yes, a tablet is a self-contained file that's part of a table structure. So it's partition. It's, it's a partition. What, 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 what's the strategy when that becomes larger or too big for the capacity? So, so you have to re, re address your partitioning strategy, right? So let's say I'm doing range partition, and this is the weakness of range, right? So we'll use the classic time series. I'm doing retail data yearly, and I want to book it every month. That's a pretty simple range partition. Well, geez, what's the number? 65% of all retail businesses in December? Wow, so I'm gonna have really crappy queries, right? So I'm gonna have one partition that's gigantic, 65% of my data, and then the rest are gonna have nothing. So you'll change your, your partitioning scheme, you'll do some sort of patch partitioning, or you'll increase the range to weekly mode. So you have to readdress that. And then of course the other way to deal with that is the classic way, right? Throw more machines at it. Maybe it does make perfect sense based on your query tools to have that range effective. So I'll just spread it out over more machines. Because the files, you can pick and choose based on your query structure different places in the file. So I'll divide up the work. That's what Impala does. So if you quickly kick this off with Impala, it looks at the file, and it has this file in six places, it will divide up across six different hosts access to the same data set. Multiple solutions, multiple different ways to handle it. No, so, but if you do hit the scale limit of a single node, it will be able to have Yeah, or more nodes, and replicate it more, right? Because if you have, let's say, let, let's just use some numbers. It's 10 terabyte table, <coughs> partition is 10 terabyte. That's the limit of, that's all I can do on this particular node. So I add three more nodes, they all have 10 terabyte. They're all gonna have the same file, but when you query the data, there's five nodes now, each one is going to do one-fifth of that file. So it may not impact your query performance, but if that's the limit of that node, you're going to have other problems, and you'll probably be forced to read the partition. And that can be done on a per-tablet basis, or is it still on so, so I don't have a complete answer for that, because it's still beta, but my presumption would be you would have to be creative. Try to think what happens in a, in a relational database when you do something like that. You have to, you have to. If you if you change the partition strategy, the data oh, needs to be real balanced. Yeah. So if you, if you uh, can you change the replication factor yes. on the per tablet? Yes. Yeah. It looks just like an HDS. You go to the file, you do an LS minus L, you get six. Although you do it graphically if you're using Cloud Era Manager, if you like. <coughs> so. Um, read consistency, that's what MVCC applies to. That's what I used in my scenario earlier, that there's an automatic timestamp placed on the data so that you can run queries as of a time. So very similar to what you do in HBase. It keeps multiple copies of that row up to whatever limit you want to set. So if you have historic data that needs to be analyzed and compared to real current data, it's a perfect fit for you. But you can set it up in terms of parameters. I only want to keep three, three versions of so any row that gets updated. And it'll just throw them away. So you, you can control the growth of your data file. <coughs> optimized, the read path is actually optimized for current time scans through a variety of very boring technical things. And I'll, and I'll tell you how to follow up on those when we're done. Um, some of the other thing there, uh, some of the design choices. So I talked about this in the in my uh, diagram, replicated masters, 
They act as the tablet directory. They have the metadata about the tables as well. Um, it's also the catalog, and then it's a load balancer. So all of those things are handled by the master. The master doesn't actually look up any data, very similar once again to the way that name nodes are deployed in HDFS. The master doesn't really do any work. It just tells everybody where all the stuff is, make sure that the replicates are balanced, all of, all of that. <coughs> so then, since it's very similar in the design to HDFS, everybody wants to know what's the weakness of performance of the master. So the master actually uses some code we took from Impala in terms of way to handle caches. Um, there's some numbers up here. We did an 80 node load test, particular size. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Very low CPU usage for access to the master. And you can see here that 99% of the queries to the master for data across 80 nodes happened in less than 68 milliseconds. As it started to reach saturation at 99.9% .9 of the time, it still responded in 657 milliseconds. So this is not access to the data. This is access to where the data is. This is the information from the master. So, so we don't really expect to have performance issues <laughs> with this in the, shor in the short term. Long term, we can probably approach it from a very variety of perspectives, um, federation, whatever those might be, uh, active actives, there might be load balancing between the masters, but there's a lot of different ways to handle that, but that's quite a ways out in the future, I think, before we have issues with that. So what are the trade-offs of Kudu? So if you think about the advantages of Kudu, you think back to my original slide where I had HDFS up here and I had HBase down here, the trade-off obviously is performance is somewhere in the center if you compare it directly to the others. So for full table scans, it's going to be dramatically faster than HBase, but it's going to be slower than HDFS. So there's some trade-offs there, so right, that'll be part of your design decision. Can I do this? Do I have to have millisecond lookup time on individual rows? If so, you might have to go to HBase, or maybe you can satisfy it with Kudu. Um, single row reads, that's what I was just was talking about. Um, columnar design is optimized for scans. What I mean by that, who's familiar with Parquet? Not the butter. <laughs> that's what I think of every time. Parquet is a file format. That I think yeah, that's right. But it's, it's a file format on top of HDFS. It's just a, it's a way to like Avro or RC or those it's a file type. Columnar compressed bitmap file type. If you use that in concert with Impala, you get tremendous speed ups because the file type itself allows for the SQL engines to pick individual columns in the file instead of reading the entire thing like you would do with a flat text file. So huge performance. Kudu uses a file type very similar to Parquet. So it's already compressed, it's already a bitmap representation, it's columnar, so you can only pick certain columns out of it if you want. You can do it broadly across the entire file structure, or just pick individual columns. So one of the things that we're going to do in the future is we're going to let you do column grouping, which is very similar to family, um, column families in HBase. And if you're interested in which algorithm we use to do the lookups, we use a Bloom search. <laughs> I don't know why that's in there. <laughs> so, we, so we have some we have some benchmarks. You have to remember that Kudu is still beta, and the benchmarks are limited to how many um, nodes we have in our development cluster. But it's actually pretty good. We have in this scenario we have 75, which I have that. Um, anyway. So this is the, essentially the scenario. We ran some TPCH benchmarks, which are the big data benchmarks managed by tpc.org. So any database vendor uses these things to compare internally and externally to everybody else. So basically we set this all up according to that benchmark. We use these versions, 2.2.5, we use the palette 2.2, and of course we use our own distribution, 5.4. Um, these are example queries, just in case you're curious. This is all defined in the benchmark itself. So we compared it to other technologies using the same benchmark. So in this scenario, we compared Kudu with Impala and Parquet on HDFS with Impala, which is currently kind of the fastest one, depends on the use case. So you can see Kudu is the brown bar. So this is basically just giant scans, right? So you can see that Kudu is about overall, if you add up all the different scenarios, about 30% faster 
then Impala on Parquet on HDFS. So it's a pretty significant performance increase. This probably isn't the sweet spot because this is a generic TPC test. So it doesn't really live in the specific use case scenarios that most customers utilize technology with. But it gives you an idea just to comparatively say, sure, it's a lot faster than, because if it's not faster, then we either got to do more development or it's not worth pursuing. <coughs> Same scenario, um, much smaller cluster, I'm not sure why. Um, who's familiar with Apache Phoenix? Nobody. Phoenix, okay, we got it. Phoenix is a SQL layer on top of HBase. So it leverages the HBase H file parameters and the structure inside of HBase, and then it provides a SQL layer on top of that. So um, it's probably not really a fair thing because Phoenix isn't widely used in the Hadoop community. It's not, not a lot of updates going on there. Uh, but anyway, the performance difference is dramatic, especially for scans, right? Because Phoenix is scanning HBase, which doesn't support scans very well. So HBase is meant entirely to be row-level kinds of accesses. Row-level inserts, updating specific rows, and accessing specific rows, because it's all based on a key. That's the file structure itself. And then you have columns that relate to the key. So anyway, so dramatically faster than Phoenix. And then we picked, who's this, Yahoo? Is it Yahoo YC? Yeah, it is. So, so these are NoSQL kinds of benchmarks. This is a benchmark published by Yahoo. You can go download the whole kit, run it on your new cluster and see how fast your stuff is. Um, one of the recommendations that we make uh, when we have our professional service teams engaged with you guys, standing up clusters, tuning clusters, it's pretty hard to tune something if you don't have benchmarks or, or level playing field. How fast is the cluster? We made these seven changes. Now how fast is the cluster? So you gotta have some point to measure against. These benchmarks work well in that scenario. And there's some other benchmarks as well. But anyway, um, no SQL random access. So this is the this is the sweet spot for HBase. So we're competing directly with a database type solution on Hadoop that was specifically designed for this. So HBase is red, Kudu is blue. So as you can see in most scenarios, depending on the type of query, Kudu is at least as fast or faster than HBase. And it's much simpler to use because what's the interface to HBase? Java. How many business analysts write Java? Okay, a couple, depends on the business. But this is access through your SQL BI tools on Kudu. Alright, so I already alluded to this slide a couple times because it took me about half an hour to make this one. But this is kind of the classic way that you handle very high volumes of streaming data. So high volume, fast. Everything comes in fast, right? So you're going to use a SQL engine to query it, but you can't really put it in the SQL engine that fast. You can append it in HDFS, but you may have to manipulate the data a little bit before that. So it probably makes more sense to drop it into HBase because you can do very rapid inserts into HBase. And then later on offline, you process the data, you stick it in Parquet, you let Impala or Drill or whoever your favorite SQL engine is access the data for analytics. So the problem with that is, is that's kind of opposite of the way you want to do things in Hadoop because it introduces a slow ETL process. But this is just the way the world is currently. So this is what you had to do before Kudu. So now you don't have to really do that. You just drop the data in Kudu. The inserts into Kudu are as fast or faster than HBase. So you don't have a performance overhead. You no longer have to do that intermediate step and then process it later. You can drop it in. You can run whatever ETL processing you want on that data in the stream or afterwards, right? So it's entirely up to you now. The data is essentially available as soon as it's flushed to disk and your analysts can leverage that data and do queries. And I have five more minutes, but I only have like two more slides. So, so I got another benchmark. What was this? Oh, this is the 70 node cluster. In case you guys are curious, it's streaming data. Um, I think it's like 2.6 2 billion rows per day or something like that. Um, the various components that we're using, the cluster uh, data node size, 64 gigs actually a little light for that many cores. 
So what this is an example of loading the data into Hadoop. And in this scenario, it compares directly into Kudu and then directly into Parquet. And you can see here, obviously I wouldn't put a benchmark up that was not flattering. So. <laughs> Less is better, right? So the query latency on a file that's being updated, and you can see here the specifics on replication and various things like that. Um, but in essence, Kudu is dramatically faster, both in terms of throughput, and while well, the throughput's less, so if you look up there, because you're writing data faster to an HDFS file here, but the query time is dramatically faster. So one of those trade-offs. All right, so where are we at with Kudu? So it's beta, it's been released maybe a month now. Um, all components core to the architecture are in the product. It is not feature complete yet. It's the first beta, so not everything is there. Um, Java, C++, and Python um, is the APIs that you can use to experiment with it. So it comes out of the box integrated with Impala, MapReduce, and Spark. So depending on your environment, what you use, you can immediately try it out in your environment. Um, obviously supports the data node architecture that you're using. Includes fault recovery, both between the masters and the tablets because of replication. And it's public beta. So you guys can go get it. A couple different ways to play with the beta. Yes. So, um, first way, you don't have to memorize these. You can go right to cloudera.com and download everything that I'm going to give you here. But a couple different ways to play with the beta. You can get the bits and make them yourself. Or you can download packages to apply to your Hadoop cluster. Or you can download a VM that's pre pre-clusterized. Right? It's a little mini cluster, has Kudu on it, has Impala, and you can play with Kudu and see if it fits one of your use cases. Um, there is um, a community set up for the beta, and there's also an email thread that you can get on for if you need help, um, which comes basically from us. There's a white paper out here that goes into essentially numbing detail of everything that I talked about, including the underlying technologies that Kudu is built upon. And in some cases, even the design criteria and how they made the decision. So it's a very interesting white paper. If you want to contribute, you guys are developers and you want to help out, you want to get on a project, there's the links for that as well. And as I mentioned, all of these things are available off of cloudera.com. And just one other aside, I know that you guys are all probably based in Phoenix, but if you're actually based in the Bay Area, there's an interesting um, cybersecurity breakfast with some executives from Cloudera. Um, I think Tom Riley is going to be there. He's the CEO of Cloudera and one of our security architects. So if you're going to be in the Bay Area then, you should probably sign up and get breakfast for free and you can talk security to your heart.